right now, I'm 18 years old. I'm an adult. It's crazy. And people are asking me important questions like, what do you want to do in life? Well, this question gives me a flashback to a day when I was five years old. I was in the car with my mom and my brother. And while we were listening to the radio, my brother said to me, did you know that most music is made with computers these days? And I sort of half believe him because he was my brother and I couldn't wrap my head around this at the time. But flash forward 13 years later, one of my passions is doing exactly what my brother was talking about, making music with computers. And what is this called? This is music technology. In this field, music innovators work closely with machines, tools, or in my case, computers to help them create music. How do you get started at something like this? Well, there's actually two, point, two points that follow music technology. One of them is creating music with technology. Pretty obvious, it's in the name. But the other part of music technology is developing new tools that will change the way we create, perform, and experience music. I didn't start developing big inventions like circuit boards or anything because I would end up breaking something like that. But I am good at creating software. I got interested in computers when I was in fifth grade. And when I was in eighth grade, I published my first iPhone app called Spike Hopper to the App Store. Sadly, it's not on there anymore today, but it was amazing once it was on. <laughs> and people enjoyed it, trust me. But all the beautiful graphics you see were done by my friend, and I managed all the coding, made sure the game works how it's supposed to. Another thing that I like to do with computers is edit other software to change how it works. This is a Nintendo DS game that I edited. This was something that my generation enjoyed playing. So here's one of my favorite childhood games, Mario Kart DS, made by Nintendo. Amazing game. And I edited it, it to do what I wanted it to do using code. So when you go the wrong way, the cloud guy comes down telling you, hey, you should do a U-turn. But I made it so that even if you're not going the wrong way and you press this button, the cloud guy will come down. Just like that. And then right when I let go of the button, he goes away. Amazing, right? Just by doing code. As you can see, this may see s seem like something that's easy, but it's actually very difficult to do, and it took me hours to figure this out. This is the actual code that changes the game to what you saw in the video. And editing games actually taught me a lot on how decimal systems work on computers and how computers store data. This is something you might recognize from the movies when they're like hacking in a matrix or something like that. It's called binary, and binary is a two de decimal digit system. As opposed to having the numbers zero through nine, we represent numbers with zeros and ones. This is why you can take amazing selfies and have them look exactly like your face and post them on Instagram. Because of binary, each digit of binary, either a zero or one, is called a bit. And bits are incredibly tiny. They're 1.25 times 10 to the negative 20 10 to the negative 25th gigabytes. And this is why we can make software so detailed. It's why we can do almost anything we want with software. Now that we've learned how software is constructed, I'd like to show you a different thing. This is software that helps me compose music. It's free and it's called MuseScore. With MuseScore, I was able to be Beethoven, but all I had to do was sit on my couch and type things in my laptop. This is one of my first compositions that I made my freshman year of high school called Smile of Fire. One thing that intrigues me about this software is how easy it is to share your music with other people. With MuseScore, what you can do is you can upload your composition to the internet, not only for other people to see, but it also allows collaboration, which is something you can't do without computers over long distances. 
Also, on top of that, it's very hard to handwrite music. I tried it myself, and there's a lot of music theory and different things you need to know. And you have to have good handwriting also. <laughs> now we're going to talk about something a little bit different, something you might have heard of. This is called MIDI. And if you have no idea what that is, it stands for Musical Digital Instrument Digital Interface. And if you have an electronic keyboard at home or you've seen D DJs pressing the buttons that do different sound effects, this is what maybe that machine that they're using uses. It's how we transmit data from electronic music instruments to computers. And it's also efficient for transferring music into sound data. It's easier to store than an MP3 file because it can use pre-recorded sounds as the instruments. And as we discussed earlier, data on computers is stored in numbers. So all MIDI is doing is sending numbers to tell the computer what sound to play or how loud to play it. This is that same piece of music I just showed you, but it's imported into a program called GarageBand. And it sounds a little bit different because I was able to add different instruments with the power of MIDI. If you haven't already seen the magic of MIDI, I have another example to show you. This is a video from my YouTube channel. And on my YouTube channel, I like to do a lot of music related things. This beat in particular I made fall of 2018, just about when school was starting. I called it the back to school beat. And I didn't just make this out of music like you usually would hear. I made it out of sounds you'd hear around school. And this one sound in particular is the school bell at this school. And because of MIDI, I was able to play it as an instrument and solo over the track I created. Now, from what I've presented so far, thank you. <laughs> from what I've presented so far, it's clear what music technology currently has to offer. However, there's a whole future. We haven't even gotten to the center of Lollipop. There's much more that music technology will be able to help musicians and even non-musicians that listen to music. One thing I like to talk about how many of you have heard of the app Shazam? Raise your hand. This app uses something called acoustic fingerprinting. This is how when your phone actually, you hold it up to the music and it listens to find out what song it is. Yeah, that's what your phone is doing. And it sends that acoustic fingerprint to the Shazam databases, which matches it up with the correct song. And it does this within a matter of seconds. However, researchers, are figuring out ways that maybe we could get it in a millisecond to figure out what song it is. And maybe even one point, I don't know if this will be possible, but I think it would be cool if we could hook it up to our brain and figure out what song it is by just plugging it into our computer and have the computer figured out. Another application similar to that though is artificial intelligence application. Comes from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Researchers here are figuring out ways to develop AI musicians that not only listen to what other people play, 
but are also able to improvise their own music within that style. The last thing I'd like to talk about to you guys tonight is one of my own ideas that I hope to continue working on after I graduate high school. And for this idea to work, I want you to close your eyes. Imagine it's been a long day at work or school, and you sit down on your couch, you open up your phone, and instead of listening to music with the music app, you decide to open an app called Aura. And this app will let you listen to music anywhere you want around the world once you put your headphones on. And it's able to do this because anybody can take out their phone and in a big auditorium or even a small garage, some space like this, you can record the sound and have your computer record the data of the acoustics of that space and emulate it. This tool, maybe in, instead of listening to music in your friend's garage, because that might be weird, you could choose to listen to it in Carnegie Hall or places around the world you want to hear what it sounds like. And for musicians, there's no more improvising on what the environment actually sounds like when you get there. One of the quotes I've heard is, often the room is the hardest instrument to play. And I experienced this when I was in an all-state band here in Minnesota. We rehearsed in a hotel ballroom, which was not the most ideal space, but then we got to perform in orchestra hall. And that's when this idea really hit me. We should be able to practice in the environments that we're gonna perform in. With that, I encourage all of you to take your ideas and bring them to life with technology. Whenever I have an idea about something I'm passionate about, it's always related to technology, and it's always something we can use to expand our ideas. This is how computers are bringing ideas to life, bit by bit. And before you know it, your idea will be next. Thank you.